Welcome to this lecture on remote sensing of wind. This is a lecture where I will try to explain you how we today use remote sensing techniques in the measurement of wind for wind energy. And the objectives that I'm going to tell you about are the different principles of using uh, remote sensing, different instrumentation, and how we use the Doppler principle, or how it works. And eventually I will show you how we have implemented wind scanners using scanner technology so we can scan wind fields all over the place in the, in the real atmosphere. So welcome and uh, let's go ahead. Um, today we have wind turbines. Um, they are becoming bigger and bigger. They are growing in size. If you look at the lower picture here, you see that back in 1979, we had very small wind turbines here at Riesø DTU. They were only 20, 30 meters tall. Meanwhile, in the beginning of the, uh, the, the millennium, they reached 100, 120 meters, as you see in this picture. And today we have huge turbines um, at our test site, Österil, testing big turbines for the wind industry, and they are more than 220 meters tall. So we are reaching almost the size of the Eiffel Tower with these turbines that are running in the atmosphere. And therefore, we need to measure the wind at very big heights and at very big fields. So the good old technique where we could use, um, as you see in this picture, a meteorological mast um, is very difficult to apply today. Because the meteorological mast only measures the wind field at one point where it's sitting and at a single uh, vertical profile. But we need to measure the wind field or the entire rotor plane of the big turbine today to understand how they are loaded with the wind and how much energy they can extract. So these are the objectives. And um, to do this, we need to look at uh, the different remote sensing techniques that we have. The challenge of using remote sensing instead of an in situ instrument is that you need to measure um, the wind by not being there. If you set up a carbon anemometer that rotates, then you can count how many revolutions at that point in time. But with remote sensing, you can only transmit, you need to look at the signal that you get back, either from sound propagation or from light propagation. You can also look at the sky, look at the clouds and see how fast they move. This is passive. But to measure the wind field around the big turbines in an active way, we have developed a system now that relies on remote sensing, active remote sensing. So we transmit a laser beam or a sound beam, and then we detect the Doppler shift that we receive back from this transmission. From that, we need to extract information about the wind speed and the wind direction. And the challenges, the main challenges with remote sensing is <coughs> two things. You need to have a sizable signal back that you can detect. That's something with signal to noise, and we need to have a decent signal to noise ratio in our measurements. And secondly, remote sensing techniques are diffuse in the sense that they don't measure just in one point, but they measure in a volume or in an area. So the challenges are good signal to noise, and the second challenge is to have um, a finite measurement volume, a small measurement volume. And this is the big challenges that we are addressing with this new technology. It's a new technology that we use today because um, in the good old days, in 1875, there was already a suggestion by Tyndall to use a big horn, like a fork horn, and then you, with the unaided ear, you were able to listen if there were any echoes in the strait. You could listen whether there was a ship or not, even though it was forking. This is using sound. But today we use um, remote sensing with um, light instead. <coughs> And light is uh, much more easy to handle than, than sound, in this sense, because um, it's more precise, as I will try to explain you now. Uh, to detect the wind speed, you need to measure a frequency shift. Um, you know all that if there's an ambulance passing you, you can hear how the tone is shifting because of the motion of the transmitter relative to the receiver, the Doppler effect. But it's the same also when you transmit a light beam. Light also shifts its frequency. Um, as for instance, you might know that uh, if you look at far uh, galaxies, they turn red. It's called redshift. So far galaxies, when you look at them in a telescope, you see how they, the, 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 the lines of hydrogen 
are shifted and you can actually detect how far away they are in this weather. This is the same with the transmission of uh, light that we use in the lighters. We detect a very small deviation, a very small change in the frequency that we transmit. We transmit a laser beam and then we look at the signal that comes back from scattering from aerosols in the atmosphere and then we compare that signal that comes back with the signal that we send out and this ratio of the frequency shift relative to the transmitted frequency is a measure of the Doppler shift. Now it's very different from sound and light. If you look at sound you have a sound speed of typically 340 meters per second and if you have 17 meters per second uh, wind speed then it's uh, five percent. So with sound you can anticipate one to five percent relative change in the frequency in what you have to detect as Doppler shift. The light, however, it's much different because the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second or 3 to the 10 to the 8 meters per second. And if you only have 3 meters per second wind speed, this fraction is only 10 to the minus 8. So it's an extremely small relative deviation in the light frequency, in the light wavelengths. And that's very difficult to detect. The frequency of light, which is in our case about 1.5 micron, the frequency is 200 uh, terahertz or 2 to 10 to the 12 to the 200, 10 to the uh, 12 hertz. So 2 to the power of 14 hertz. And the frequency shift that you get back is only uh, a megahertz. So this fraction is 10 to the minus 8. And the way no electronics can detect the, the absolute frequency. It's way too high. So we need to mix down. We need to use this principle we call coherent detection. We mix the return signal that scatters from the aerosols with the transmitted frequency. And then we get an interference, which is of the order megahertz. And this we can detect with the common electronics. And this is how it works. Let's look at these equations. These are the relative change in frequency and they are of the order of the change in the wind speed relative to the transmission velocity. The transmission velocity can be sound speed or light speed. <coughs> and from this comes the Doppler equation that you see here. And now I will show you how this is derived. That there's a, this is the physics, but there's a coefficient of minus 2 in front of this and this you can understand from this simple argument that I'll show you here. So let's look at the Doppler equation that was developed by Christian Doppler back in 1842. We have the dispersion relation for the Doppler shift, which is a relation between the frequency and the wave number that's given. And we transmit a frequency, F0, which is very stable. The very stable frequency hits an aerosol, and it, the aerosol acts like a small mirror and transmits light back. So because the aerosol acts like a, an, a, a mirror, it is an inelastic uh, scatter we are talking about. So the backscatter wave number is almost the same as the incoming wave number. So you can tell that from this, if it's an elastic scatter, the change in, in uh, wave number is simply twice the length or the size of the wave number. And to calculate the change in the wave number. You can take, it's a vector sum, so you take the return signal minus the incoming wave number and that's a minus two times the size of the vector itself. So from here the minus two comes that I showed you in the previous equation. Now you take the delta k and put it into the dispersion relation and then you have the Doppler shift equation. And the Doppler shift equation simply says that uh, if you have a wavelength, a laser or sound with a certain wave number, and you have a speed of the object that you are measuring, then you get a frequency shift of this order, minus two times the Doppler shift divided by the wavelength. And if we take a laser, it's approximately 1.3 megahertz per meter per second. So if you have a one meter per second uh, wind speed in our laser beam, then we will expect a frequency shift of 1.3 megahertz, which is easily detectable by today's electronics. So that's the background behind the Doppler shift that we use. Then you need to focus your laser beam where you want to measure. There are two ways to do that. 
You can, for instance, send out a pulse like a radar. So you have a finite pulse that you transmit and you know the time of flight goes with the speed of light and then you can detect from where your backscatter is coming. That's one way. Another way is to use the so-called continuous wave principle. And then you need a good telescope. A good telescope is a very high quality lens system that can take your single wave number, single wavelength, and keep it collimated, keep it focused at very long distances. If you have ideal telescope, for instance, like the Hubble telescope, it has a diameter of one meter, and you use this um, wavelength that we are using here, one micron, then you have 1,000 of kilometers. Then you can keep your laser beam collimated 1,000 kilometers in front of the Hubble telescope. We don't have Hubble telescopes. We have good telescopes, but they are typically two, three, or four inch in diameters only. But we can easily keep the beams collimated or focused uh, within the range where we are measuring the wind, which is typically of the order of a few kilometers. And now if we want to measure the wind speed at a certain point, then we focus the beam so we get a very high intensity at the focus point. So if I want to measure the wind speed at 200 meters distance, then I focus my camera, like my telescope, at 200 meters, and I make sure that the intensity of the laser radiation then peaks at 200 meters. And then I measure the wind speed in that little volume. This is how it works. And after that, it disperses. So you need good optics and you get need very stable lasers to achieve uh, remote sensing. We have used this principle uh, in uh, our test equipment, uh, in this case in Husur in Jutland. Uh, if you go back to 2004, you will see that there were only solar devices, sound devices, not a single wind lighter at that point. But soon after, and just a year after 2006, we had a series of continuous wave uh, Zephyr lighters. We had uh, Leosphere pulse lighter systems and Skur Energy uh, pulse lighter systems. So in that aftermath of this millennium, soon after, the millennium, the whole field changed from being mainly focused on acoustic devices to today being mainly using um, laser-driven remote sensing equipment. And now we can use these technologies. Here's an example. We have what we call a wind scanner. This is a continuous wave lighter. And we can focus it in front of the, of the, uh, the telescope and we can measure the wind at different distances. This picture here shows how we instrument that we have a small island called Bolon just outside Brisu DTU. So in the morning we could drive out the scanner. We had to cross some water, carry up the instrument mounted on top of the hill. And then here you see the hill. So we could install the LiDAR system here and measure the wind flow in front of the island. And this is what the instrument can do. The instrument then has some prisms, two prisms, so it can move its beam up and down or wherever we want to point it in two directions. And in this case, we made virtual midmasts in front of the hill. So there's a midmast, a virtual midmast, uh, 20 meters in front of the hill, and then there's one where the hill begins, and then we could install as many virtual midmasts and measure wind profiles as we wanted to do. So with this instrumentation, this single lighter, we were simply able to measure the wind in front of the hill. And as you approach the hill and came closer and closer to the lighter, you could see how the wind profile changed. And you can see you get much more wind energy and much higher wind speed being on, on top of the hill here than being up, up front. So that's an example. You can also measure turbulence because the instrument is very fast. It samples 400 samples per second. So you can measure many profiles in very short time. And you can scan, like we have done here, in 2D, the wind profile and the turbulence profile. This is one use. We can also point the lighter totally vertical and just keep it pointing vertical. And then we can measure the wind speed, in this case, the vertical component at many heights. And this is what we have done in this graph. It was a clear day where we start in the morning. What you see here is time of day. And what you have up here is the height up to two kilometers. In the morning, 
in this case again in Jutland there's absolutely no turbulence, but as the sun sets on and the bottom of the atmosphere starts to cook because of the heat, then you can see how turbulence de develop. And during the day, it develops more and more. And in the afternoon, you have a very, very high level of turbulence, in this case at 600, 700 meters of the vertical wind component. And maybe you experience this if you land an airplane, if you go to a, if you are going to land in the afternoon, you very often experience that you have very bumpy rides and very lots of turbulence. But think of that when you get closer to the ground, the turbulence disappears. So when the airplane comes down to 150 meters, you can see how the turbulence level decreases. And that's because of the presence of the ground. The vertical turbulence cannot exist when there's a boundary. So think of that if you get nervous, it gets bumpy. I want to tell you also, to make sure that you understand that the LiDAR only measures the velocity component in the direction of the laser beam. It doesn't measure the two transverse components. So if you really want to measure 3D turbulence, you need three of them to be um, working at the same time. And we have developed some instruments that does this. Um, this is a so-called spinner LiDAR. Uh, it's an instrument that you can install on a turbine, or you can put it into the spinner itself, and then it measures the wind speed in front of a turbine, and you can use this for controlling the turbine or optimizing the power. It's called a spinner lighter. It's still a lighter like we talked about, but here you see the scan head, where there are two prisms that can steer the beam in two independent directions. And here's an example. Um, we steer the prisms so that the laser beam is following this nice pattern here, and every time the color changes, it has made one measurement. So in this uh, rosette scan, which we can run through with a scanner in one second, you get 400 measurements. So 400 measurements per second. And if you combine that color code, the wind, the wind speed that you measure, you get these high resolution uh, pictures of the inflow in front of the turbine. And this we can refer to as a, 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 a wind speed camera. It's a camera that measures the wind speed in front of the turbine. And then you can see there can be shear, there can be wakes from other turbines. And this is very useful for optimal control of a wind turbine and also for yawing the, tur the turbine into the wind. So in short, um, I have shown you a short history of the remote sensing techniques. It started with sound. It's now, today, it's ma mainly based on on laser technology. I explained to you the Doppler shift and the Doppler equation. There's a minus two in front of it because light is scattered back and it changes its uh, wave number. And I showed you here very lastly the spinner lighter where we can steer the beam and um, make a picture of the wind with just a single laser. But also the wind scanner technology, often we have three lighter systems that work together coherently and make full 3D wind field uh, measurements of all three wind components, UV and W.